French archaeologists found it buried in the sands of what is now Iran in 1901. The pieces of a great pillar of black stone carved in the ancient region of Mesopotamia more than 3,600 years earlier. At the top of the massive pillar, or steel, were two figures, the ancient Babylonian sun god, flames coming from his shoulders, and Hammurabi, the most famous king of Babylon. Hammurabi had turned Babylon into an empire, conquering independent city-states throughout the Fertile Crescent, the rich farmland between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. To establish order and unify all of these different cities and people, Hammurabi needed one universal set of laws to, as he wrote, bring about the rule of righteousness in the land to destroy the wicked and the evildoers so that the strong should not harm the weak. More than 250 of those laws are carved in columns onto this steel. In characters and symbols, one of the oldest known written codes of conduct setting out rules of behavior and specific, often harsh punishments. If anyone is committing a robbery and is caught, then he shall be put to death, states law number 22. More than 30 laws call for the guilty to be put to death, sometimes in gruesome ways, by being impaled, burned, or thrown into water. That meant being tossed in the Euphrates River. If the accused drowned, it was seen as proof of guilt because the gods didn't save him or her. But if the river proved that the accused is not guilty and he escaped unhurt, reads the code, the accused was innocent, and then he who had brought the accusation shall be put to death. Causing a death was often punishable by death. If a builder constructed a house that collapsed and killed the homeowner, that builder shall be put to death. If the homeowner's son was killed in the collapse, the son of that builder shall be put to death. Punishment was often reciprocal. If a man put out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out, reads law number 196, one of the most famous in that code. But eye for an eye justice wasn't applied equally. Punishments varied depending on the social class of both the accused and the accuser. If a higher class landowner put out the eye of a commoner, for example, he only had to pay a fine of one gold mina. According to the code, women in every social class had lower status than men. Several laws restricted what women could do, but others protected women's rights to inherit a field, a garden, or a house, and to divorce their husbands. A wife who could prove abandonment or neglect could take her dowry and go back to her father's house. Laws in the code cover liability, malpractice, trade, even the minimum wage to be paid to workers in specific occupations. Six gur of corn per year for an ox driver, eight gur for a cattle or sheep herder, four giras for a rope maker, and five giras for a potter. Elements of law and justice carved in the pillar are still found printed in modern law books, thousands of years later. The presumption of innocence, for example, and the right of two parties in dispute to bring their case before a judge and provide evidence and witnesses. It seems clear Hammurabi meant the code to stand as a permanent set of legal precedents. Most of the monument has survived for thousands of years, an ancient system of law and order set in stone. A little video there, of course, on the Hammurabi Code, a uh, very famous, uh, of course, one of the earliest law codes uh, written in the world. So anyway, I want to welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there. Uh, of course, you know, last week we had, of course, the first week of classes at Baton Rouge Community College. I so hope you were having a you know great week last week uh, more than anything. Of course, this class, of course, we're going into week two, uh, of course, the History 1113 this, of course, is the first seven weeks class. So, anyway, it looks like we got a few watching right now. I know Fernando's watching uh, in StreamYard right now. So, I hope you're having a great week, Fernando. Uh, also, uh, Richard's watching also on YouTube uh, right now. And so is uh, Jennifer. So, anybody else out there, you know, let me know, of course, if you're watching live, of course, this particular lecture. It looks like most of you, of course, will watch later, of course, on my YouTube channel. So, 
Uh, anyway, um, before we get started today, just want to got a lot of reminders, of course, to send out to you, uh, you know, about what's going on uh, with the class. Uh, I've got a list of them right here, but pretty much, uh, of course, you have that contract policy page. If you have not sent it to me, you know, get that to me uh, if you can uh, this week. I think the pre-test closed the other day. Uh, so uh, if you still want to remain in the class, I guess you pretty much will be in the class because most of you, I think, did the pre-test. Uh, but try to send me, of course, the contract policy page. Uh, also due later in the week is the prehistory quiz, which will be due like midweek, uh, number one there, of course. And then I, I am putting up another quiz today uh, early on, uh, probably not due to later next week, but uh, the one on Mesopotamia, I'll have a quiz on that one uh, also as well. And also, I did want to remind you that the first vocab is actually due next week on Monday, which I believe is August the 30th. So to kind of send some reminders out there about that, about some of the things that are kind of going on uh, right now uh, with the class. Uh, now, if you have any uh, comments, questions, of course, about the you know lecture or previous lectures or anything about, I guess, the class, let me know uh, either through my YouTube channel or you can um, obviously – Send me comments, questions, via YouTube or email, uh, either one. So if you have a live comment, you know, during the lecture, you know, let me know. Of course, I'll try to answer it, you know, as best as I can. Uh, so uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, of course, in today's uh, lecture, of course, uh, I'll be, of course, talking about the later part of you know, Mesopotamia. I'm going to kind of get into some of the later civilizations, like the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians, now I'll get into the uh, Chaldean, Chaldean Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, sometimes called the Neo or New Babylonian Empire. So that's kind of most of the main topics I'll, I'll kind of get into today. If you want to join me in StreamYard, there's the link, of course, below uh, right there. Uh, and, um, and, of course, I did kind of share a little short video, of course, uh, from NBC News Learn, I think, which was on the uh, Hammurabi Code. Uh, just kind of showing you that and might have some little other video clips I kind of show you later, or kind of more humorous, I guess I'll have. I'll show you that later, uh, which has to do more of the Assyrians. All right. So uh, anyway, um, I think last time uh, we had, like I said, we had a part one lecture, of course, where I went into the background of Mesopotamia. Uh, I primarily discussed the Sumerian uh, culture uh, that was dominant in Iraq a long time ago. I think we also talked about the Akkadian state, Akkadian empire uh, that was also there. And then, of course, I talked about how Iraq or Mesopotamia back then broke up into these two uh, spheres of influence, the north, of course, being more what they call Assyria later. And then one we'll talk about more today, in the southern part of, of Iraq, which, of course, was Babylonia, where, of course, the ancient city of Babylon uh, was there, of course, a long time ago. And uh, so I want to go ahead and first talk about the Babylonians, which, yeah, there's different names that they refer to as the Babylonian state. Uh, of course, oftentimes uh, they often call it the Old Babylonian Empire. I actually got a map showing you. Uh, I think I've got one down here, kind of a maybe a larger map right there. But it's usually called either the Old Babylonian Empire or some people also call it the Paleo -Bab Babylonian Empire. They call it that because of the fact that there were uh, uh, later empires that kind of dominated uh, Babylonia. There was one that was like a middle Babylonia uh, where the Kassites kind of controlled it, which I'll explain who they were a little later. And the Neo or New Babylonian state was like this state that was um, controlled by uh, mostly the, what they call the Chaldean peoples who were in uh, southern Iraq, uh, you may have heard of that state because it was ruled by Nebuchadnezzar, the famous king that's mentioned in the, you know, the Bible and all of that. Uh, and um, so you get this, this new state that kind of emerges. They call it Babylonian. And of course, they call it that because of the fact that um, uh, this particular state uh, was, a, was a type of state that um, – it was called, it was based around Babylon, the city of Babylon, of course, which was originally they think Babylon was some type of Akkadian uh, city and city state that, that went back to like 4,000 years ago. 
at one point. And uh, over time, it was made into a major city and capital uh, that, that ruled that southern part of Iraq uh, and was, you know, the capital of multiple empires uh, throughout that region. Uh, they often called it Babylon, I think is the ancient name that they often called Babylon, uh, which Babylon meant, um, supposedly it meant the gate of the God, because I think it had something to do with the well, I'll get to the Neo-Babylonian state that they have later, uh, which uh, was famous for the so-called Ishtar Gate, uh, which I guess is supposed to be the Ishtar Gate, which is right here. I guess that's what they're talking about, the gate of, with it, the gate that honored the goddess Ishtar. I think it also, got it, uh, also uh, honored the god uh, Maratuk, which I mentioned before about uh, as well. But... Um, so Babylon's the old name. Uh, also, the Israelites, who at one point were in captivity there as well, the Jews uh, often, I think they say, got the name from the Bible, uh, from the Tower of Babel, from the word Babel, which meant confusion, I think I mentioned before. And so I think that's also the origin of kind of where the name came from. Because uh, I guess when the Jews went there, uh, they were kind of struck with this awe of the fact that this was such a huge civilization, which had, you know, all these cultures, but kind of strange language and strange gods, you know, and things like that. Uh, King Hammurabi, of course, who I mentioned before, like I said, was their greatest ruler. He was actually not the first ruler. He was the sixth ruler of, of the uh, Babylonian state. Uh, and uh, the actual um, Babylonian state was actually ruled by a dynasty of kings, which were uh, from Amorite origins. Amorites were these types of um, Semitic peoples uh, that came out of um, what is um, Syria, they believe. And over time, they, they took control of Babylon. And so most of the kings that are you know, related to the ba old Babylonian state of Hammurabi are descended from the Amorite peoples and not really Akkadian, because I think most of the Babylonian state was a mix of Akkadian peoples and, of course, Amorites that, that took it over. But a lot of the nobility, apparently the upper classes, uh, were mostly of Amorite uh, origin. Uh, if you know about um, about uh, King Hammurabi, uh, he, of course, is very famous for his uh, code. Well, that you, of course, I think everybody's heard about the code of Hammurabi, which is, of course, well known today. Uh, of course, we already saw the little short video that I showed you about that, but he's pretty much synonymous, you know, with, with that particular law code system, which by the way, it was not the first law code system to be established like in the world. I think I mentioned before that the Sumerians had had a, originally a code, which was called the code of ur uh, which I think had about 32 laws on it. And I think that code may have influenced Hammurabi to create his own version of a law code system, which was obviously more established and uh, obviously better, better well written, more extensive. It was a lot longer. I think it was, I think had way more more laws than, than that one did. Like at least nine, probably nine to ten times more laws than the original code of the Sumerians had uh, before. Uh, they also think that the Hammurabi code influenced other law code systems, like Mosaic law and. A lot of biblical laws, like in the Ten Commandments and things like that, uh, were also heavily influenced uh, by it. Uh, actually, the co the code itself uh, was originally found from a, a stone column called a steel or stella uh, that was found in southern Iran in 1901 by archaeologists. Uh, it's like a, not quite eight feet tall. I think it's like seven foot and seven feet and four inches tall. So how tall the actual uh, stone slab is or column that they found. It was originally written in Akkadian cuneiform. I think it's got like something like 3,600 lines of cuneiform, which is written in the actual laws. There's also a prologue that they wrote with it too uh, to go along with the codes. And they found other fragments of the code, like different, you know, stone columns. But there's only one that they found intact uh, that's now in the Louvre, of course, in Paris, France. Uh, which I do have pictures of, uh, which is right here. There it is uh, in the Louvre. Uh, it's in the, I think, so-called Richie Lou Wang. And um, at the top of it, uh, which you can see 
right here and right here. It actually shows what they think is uh, one of the gods back then, which they think was Shamash, the god of justice, and I think seen as a solar deity, giving the, I guess, the code to what they think is King Hammurabi, which they think on the right here, that's supposed to be the, what they think is a statue or the head of a statue of what was, I guess, King Hammurabi. So, yeah, the law codes were, were very interesting, and the fact that they were considered, you know, some of the most famous law codes, you know, written in the world at that point so far, and, of course, had a major influence on other other law systems later. It did have about 282 laws that they've been able to translate uh, from cuneiform. Uh, the laws uh, work on a principle you may have heard of, which is either called eye for an eye or tooth for tooth, which actually does appear in the actual code. Uh, as you know, it appears in the Bible also as well. They think that might be the origin of where, where the biblical sayings come from with that. I know like law 196 uh, talks about eye for an eye, and then law number 200 talks, for, talks about knocking someone's teeth out or tooth for a tooth. But the idea was that basically if somebody did something to you that legally you could some do something to them in retaliation. So hence the term lex talonis or law of retaliation being a form of, you know, principle of how the codes actually work. But you saw in the video how they said that it depended on like, you know, your social standing. So if like the upper classes uh, could obviously get away with a lot of stuff. They might get away with a fine or something, right? But lower classes, obviously, death might be something that might happen or obviously cutting something off like a hand or tongue or, you know, or cutting your ear off or something like that were often punishments that, that were in there. It seems like all their laws, either the punishments, either a fine, death, or cutting something off. <laughs> so um, I have examples of some of the laws that are in the code. All right, here. Here's something like 195. The son strikes his father, his hand shall be cut off. That's pretty amazing there. Uh, 197, if he breaks another man's bone, his bone shall be broken. Uh, if anyone strike the body of a man higher in rank than he, he shall receive 60 blows with an ox whip in public. It's all kinds of different ones. Uh, 282, if a slave says to his master, you are not my master, if they convict him, his master shall cut off his ear. I think they do that in some modern times, in some cases, I've heard of. Um, here's some other ones. If, if anyone is committing a robbery and is caught, then he shall be put to death. But quite often, anybody commits robbery or a murder, quite often the punishment was death, uh, pretty much. So now I already talked about the one about the eye for an eye. If a man knock out the teeth of his equal, his teeth shall be knocked out, which is number 200. Uh, the one for tooth for a tooth was 196 as an example. So, so yeah, the codes are, codes are pretty swift. Uh, but you saw in the codes how, you know, women had various rights uh, under the codes. Uh, there's even cases where they could possibly divorce their husband, uh, you know, and things like that. Uh, they also could uh, will things, like give things away, like, like they're part of their estate or something like that. And I think they could own slaves also as well, et cetera, transact business and things like that, which a lot, a lot of laws later, women don't have as many rights as under, you know, the Hammurabi code uh, in general. So, so those are just examples of some of the, you know, the laws that were under the code, but the code itself was probably likely developed, you know, to create more stability uh, within the empire of his, uh, and then I guess everybody knew what the, the laws were, you know, and so on to create like justice and not have chaos you know, running everything. So if you don't have laws, you don't really have a state. You know, if nobody follows them, uh, et cetera. Uh, after that, you know, they had a dynasty of Hammurabi, which uh, he had sons, grandsons, you know, reigned pretty much after that. The actual uh, empire only lasted about maybe two centuries about. And uh, what happened to the... Um, the actual um, empire itself, it was conquered by these other people in what is Western Iran, uh, which uh, eventually is going to be the Kassites. But something happened before that, which is very interesting. 
uh, there was a power that came in, which was called the Hittites. The Hittites who were up in Turkey, uh, in what they call Anatolia, which is the old name for Turkey a long time ago. They came in and sacked Babylon about 1595. And then um, the Hittites didn't stay in Iraq. They went back up into Turkey. Uh, and then another group called the Kassites came in. The Kassites were these like um, kind of like Iranian peoples that lived in western Iran around where the Zagros Mountains were. And they, they actually occupied that part of Babylonia for a few hundred years. I think like three, four hundred years you can see there. Uh, and so you have this middle Babylonia type state that's kind of there briefly uh, controlled by the Babylonian, by the Kassites. Uh, until I think the Assyrians came in later and kind of absorbed it into the Assyrian Empire, which I'll kind of talk about later. But yeah, I did want to get a little bit today and just kind of briefly uh, talk about the Hittite Empire. Uh, the Hittites were a type of Indo-European people uh, that came out of, uh, well, I say modern Turkey. It's about where they were. Uh, they also controlled uh, Syria. If you can if you see this map here, uh, where it says Carchemish and Aleppo, which is right here. They controlled that area uh, as well, which was part of their empire at one point. And, but they don't think the Hittites were originally from uh, that area where Anatolia or Turkey is. They think they were from like maybe where the Eastern Europe is and the Southern area of U the Ukraine, like right above the Black Sea uh, is where they originated from. And over time, they migrated there as a people uh, in, into uh, Turkey, they think something like 4,000 years ago or more. Uh, they have different names for the state. I mean, later in the Bible, they use the term Hittite, like Hittite Empire, but the term they often used for their state was the Empire of Hattusa or the Hatti, uh, which I think oftentimes they'll say the Hattians is what they actually called uh, the Hittites. And you can see their capital, which is up in the more than northern part of Turkey, a uh, city called Hattusus. Uh, which is right here. So that's their capital of most of their state or states that are there at one point. And so they control Turkey and Syria and Hittites later, by the time you get down to the end of the Bronze Age, are kind of a rival state uh, to the Egyptians' empires, uh, especially like the New Kingdom. Uh, that's, you know, controlling most of like Egypt from into like southwestern Asia, because Egypt actually spreads at one point uh, into controlling where Israel and Syria is, or part of Syria as well. Uh, these are famous kings that were kind of well-known with the Hittites, at least early on. Uh, they had a Tusilus or a Tus yeah, a Tusilus or tu a Tusilus, pronounced either way, I think. As long as they put an S on the end, uh, by the way. Uh, they think he founded the capital sometime in the 17th century, uh, and so um, and then there was another king, I want to say it was his grandson uh, named Mursula or Merciless uh, was his name. And he uh, is famous for sacking Babylon close to, like you can see, close to 1600 BC. And so that's like their first two, you know, uh, kings that were kind of well known uh, uh, early on. Uh, there is one thing that the Hittites are very famous for. Uh, they were one of the first to begin smelting iron, which they think iron was first developed from meteorites. Uh, and then they think the Hittites may have started creating iron tools and weapons uh, from iron ore. You know, Turkey's got a lot of mountains where they can mine for iron ore, et cetera. And so over time, what happened was they believed this, um, you know, allowed states like the Hittites and others to start using iron technology uh, in warfare. Uh, but at the time, it was kind of primitive because uh, they're probably using like, you know, bronze and iron type weapons uh, being used. They're not really mass produced on a large scale until Assyrian times, but they do think the Hittites may have helped to kind of launch the whole Iron Age, which will, you know, kind of start occurring, they think, starting after 1200 B.C. Uh, and most of the Near East gets it first, and then from there it kind of spreads elsewhere to other parts of of like Europe and Asia. Uh, they think the Hittite Empire peaked in the 13th century. There was a battle, which I'll probably talk about later when I get to the Egyptians, but the Hittites and the uh, Egyptians at one point battled uh, for control of Syria. It was a battle that's very famous in 
I know Egyptian history, which is called the Battle of Kadesh, which happened, they think, about 1275. And it was actually a deal where they actually signed a, a peace treaty between them, between the two states to create peace uh, in general. And this was at the time of Ramses the Great, also known as Ramses the uh, Second, who was in power. And uh, but that was that was the last hurrah, you know, really of the whole, you know, Hittite state uh, at that point. Uh, and um, what happened was there was a, a people that came in out of the Mediterranean Sea and sacked them, called the Sea Peoples. Uh, they were called the Sea Peoples were some kind of confederation of uh, seafaring raiders. They came up with ships, and they think they may have had iron weapons uh, also as well. Uh, they attacked the Mediterranean, uh, they attacked Cyprus, they attacked Turkey, they went to the Levant, they also attacked Egypt uh, as well. And um, these peoples, uh, of course, would later, they think, end up causing the Hittite state to collapse afterwards. They think it also caused uh, Egypt to also decline. Uh, they're they're the sea peoples are very mysterious. A lot of historians do not know who they are. They, they had all kinds of theories that they may have been the Greeks. Uh, they may have been the Israelites. They may have been the Philistines. Uh, there's all kinds of theories uh, that they put forth about who they were. I think here's another one. See, like the Mycenaean, Minoans, that some people think it's them. Some people think it was the Trojans. Uh, some people think it was the Phrygians who were in the Balkans areas or really Turkey later, according to Herodotus. Uh, but um, so, yeah, there's all kinds of theories on, you know, who the so-called sea peoples were. You know, they still don't know, I think. It's still kind of talked about today. Uh, I do know they, they I think they may have burned the capital of the Tusas. Tusas, I think, was practically almost wiped out uh, after that. So what they think happened with this uh, was that it caused the late Bronze Age collapse. Uh, which happens right afterwards. And so areas of like Greece, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Levant, et cetera, has a deal where their cultures just collapse overnight uh, after that. And they're replaced by Iron Age type civilizations that come in. Syrians and Iraq, uh, you get, uh, I think, the Greeks that come in, you know, into like Greece uh, later on. They replace the Mycenaeans uh, as a culture. So all these things kind of happen. Uh, afterwards. So let's kind of talk about what happened with the Hittites. I don't usually spend too much time talking about the Hittites you know, and all of that, but I want to go ahead and move on next. Here's kind of a map of maybe how they had faded. Uh, you can see uh, most of the actual sources on the Sea Peoples come from the Egyptians. They left most information about it and about why we, we know who they were. And um, I think there was one thing where I thought that I thought the uh, what was the Egyptian said about the sea peoples that was kind of interesting about them? They thought they weren't Semitic. They were like a non-Semitic people that invaded. So that's one key thing maybe, but they don't really know much about who they were though. Now I want to move on next to talk about the development of Assyria, which of course the so-called Assyrian empire, which uh, comes in next. Uh, and, um, yeah, following that dark age, you get a dark age period after the collapse, the Bronze Age cultures that you've got. you got Assyria that emerges in the northern northern part of Iraq in Syria, which uh, is more based around the uh, Tigris River Valley, especially the upper Tigris. And you get this so-called Assyrian state or Assyrian empire, which will eventually emerge. Uh, and I do have maps uh, kind of showing uh, the areas of where uh, Syria uh, will develop. We kind of bring it up right here, but uh, but you can see here um, the area of uh, the Syrian Empire is massive. Uh, it's like one of the first Near Eastern empires, which control actually the southwestern part of Asia, but also at one point Egypt. They actually control Egypt for a short time, uh, the Assyrians, but uh, they. They developed as mostly a city-state. We go back to the Bronze Age originally uh, along the Tigris Basin around a city called Asser or Asher, which is called. That was its original capital. And it was named for, uh, they think, a god they worshipped, which I'll talk about, which is called Asher, uh, which was believed to be some type of um, Assyrian war god uh, that was real popular. 
Later, they have another city I'll talk about later, uh, which you see up here. So you got the city of Asher, which is you know right here. And then uh, above Asher uh, on the uh, Tigris, you have Nineveh. Nineveh is a later capital city they have, which is more of a capital of the so-called Neo-Assyrian Empire. But Asher was originally the capital of like the old uh, kingdom of, of Assyria. So I think it started as a kingdom. You know, over time, it became an empire uh, eventually. And um, I guess Asher means the people of Asher. It's kind of what it means, uh, which Asher was their primary god. Uh, they think it was some kind of solar deity uh, that people worshipped that was in the form of a winged disc, I think, sometimes. And then somehow, sometimes it's seen as a man with a flying chariot is what it looks like in some images uh, overall. By the way, the Assyrians were a very warlock-like people. Um, like like the, if you read the Bible later, you know, uh, the Jews that write part of the Bible, you know, Old Testament, uh, write a lot of nasty things about it. They, they hated the Assyrians, and uh, they were kind of a vicious people that were known for conquering vast amounts of territory. Uh, first, probably do that with their massive armies. But, um, oh, they had another god. Where's that other god that's kind of famous? Uh, they have, I thought I had a picture of her somewhere. I don't know what happened to her. Oh, here she is right here. Uh, you may have heard of Ishtar. That's another guy that was kind of famous that uh, the Syrians worshipped that was well known. Uh, all, originally known as Inanna to the Sumerians. Uh, by the time of Assyrian and Babylonian times, uh, that becomes a real popular god uh, to the Assyrians. And it's mostly a fertility goddess. Uh, it was also seen as a god that's kind of similar to like an Isis or maybe an Aphrodite, uh, kind of later. It was associated with love, beauty, sex. It was also a kind of a female goddess of, you know, justice uh, and also war. So it seems like something like Athena, you know, also a little bit too, uh, as we're later. Um, now, uh, the peak of the Assyrian Empire, I'm going to get more into it later, but they're going to have this state that emerges later uh, which is the, they call it later, the, you have the old, you can see up here, right here, the old uh, Assyrian state or kingdom or empire, which was mostly based in like the northern part of Iraq and part of Syria. So it started out as this smaller state uh, that was more Bronze Age culture. Uh, and then they think under this king named Tiglath-Pelazar III, Assyria merged uh, in the Iron Age to become this more massive empire. Uh, which was called either the New or the Neo-Assyrian uh, Empire. Uh, and, of course, it was based at, like I told you, the capital of Nineveh, uh, which was located north of Asher uh, along the, of course, the same Tigris River uh, that we're talking about. So, yeah, they consider uh, this particular empire to be the peak of the whole Assyrian state uh, that they had. And... Um, it's one of the largest empires in history so far. Uh, you get other empires later, like the you know the Persian Empire, the Greeks uh, that come in later. Uh, but this particular state will be so massive that it it's it's composed of multiple territories. Uh, these are the areas they control at one point. Uh, the Syrian Empire later, of course, most of Iraq was controlled by them. They controlled Syria. They controlled parts of Turkey. They controlled part of Western Iran uh, as well. Uh, don't have it in there, but also where Israel, Lebanon is, uh, was controlled by them. And also they actually, for a brief time, uh, which I believe was in the 7th century, I think it's the 7th or 7th or 6th century, I think which one it is exactly, uh, they actually, the uh, 7th century it was, they controlled Egypt a little bit for a brief time. You know, but I think they lost it later. Uh, the Assyrian Empire, by the way, besides being the first major, you know, age, Iron Age Empire, uh, it was one of the first to have really good professional armies that were, you know, armed with iron weapons, uh, you know, iron armor, things like that. And uh, they were uh, masters of siege warfare. They would literally, you know, take cities easily using siege equipment. Uh, and um, they got like a slide right here to think about that, uh, which is right here. But yeah, they were one of the first to have these armies where they had like a, um, 
like a core of engineers, uh, which built like, you know, siege equipment. Uh, they built bridges. They built roads because uh, the Assyrians were the first to build like roads uh, throughout their empire. Uh, besides iron weapons, they use like horses. They also use camels as well to supply like a like at a core of camels that would supply stuff to their armies. Uh, they had battering rams to knock down doors or part of walls, movable towers uh, to, you know, that would roll up to a city and, and either knock down walls or get over the walls. Probably use ladders a lot too, which a lot of armies do uh, as well, as well. Uh, to do that. So the Syrians were known for a lot of unique things. Use of catapults, I think, was something they also had too as well. But these are things that later armies, Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, will use a lot in future, you know, armies, you know, during the Iron Age. So you, in a sense, you can say that the Syrian armies were really the prototype armies of the future, like in ancient times. So there's some other things. So, yeah, they had a use of camels, system of roads, armored cavalry, which you know, pretty much had uh, also as well. And I think their armies could move pretty quick, like in a day exactly. But I forget how many how many uh, they could move in a day, but the maximum range of their army was about 300 miles uh, in one day, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, they were considered, by the way, cruel conquerors. That's one thing they're known for because uh, one of the things they talk about with, you know, the the Syrians was that, that they were very famous for ma uh, mass deportations of enemy populations. Like they would take a state, they would take all the best people back to their to Syria, and assimilate them and use them for like conscription into the army. Like the men, all uh, the best women were brought back. Uh, they used people as slaves a lot. And I think the rest people just killed them all. Is what they did to the rest of the people uh, more than anything. Uh, examples of this was with the 10 lost tribes of Israel. You may have heard the story about this, but uh, the Assyrian kings uh, later just basically uh, took, took parts of Israel, which was in the northern part of Israel today where Samaria is, and I guess the West Bank now, and basically deported all of them back to Assyria. And they were so-called lost, as you know, in history. But a lot of them were assimilated into Assyria, you know, used as slaves, uh, or the men were forced into the armies, uh, et cetera. And so they just, quote, disappeared uh, from history. Uh, they don't take Judah, though. Judah, the state of Judah, you know, is later still there, but it'll later fall to the Chaldean Empire under Nebuchadnezzar uh, as well. But this particular state, you know, um, it, it expands, like I said, all over the Near East. And uh, for a while, it even controlled uh, parts of Egypt at one point. Uh, whoa. Um, oh, it looks like Dacians joined us. Hey, I didn't see that earlier, but I hope you're having a great you know, afternoon uh, out there as well. Also, another thing that they're famous for, the Assyrians uh, also adopted a new language, uh, which by the time of the Neo-Assyrian state, uh, this became Aramaic. And you may have heard of Aramaic because later it's spoken by like, Jesus and other people like in the Middle East. And this was a type of Semitic language that they think originated in Syria. Well, it kind of spread to uh, that part of the world in the Middle East. And um, anyway, if you know about it today, it's still spoken today. People still you know, speak variations of Neo-Aramaic, I guess as they called it, or I think the common name they call it is Syriac, is what they call it now uh, today. And it's mostly spoken by Christians, like like Assyrian Christians, I think, and uh, other people kind of similar to that. And I do have a clip kind of showing you that, kind of speaking in uh, like Assyrian language, which is, uh, it's really Neo-Arabic, but it's, uh, I'll show you the part one of it, uh, which is from the Assyrian Comedy Club. Bruni? Oh, Bruni. Oh, yeah. Smiddag bloed, het gaat toch een goede leg, u kan het dan? Ja, smiddag. Hé, kunnen we ze dienen kiezen met Tamara, Belg, Miele? Pat in de gezellig nog Bronnie. Hij is met het Guara. Hij pat er zich nog Bachta. Alleen bij het eer bracht het. Gaat die Jusze aai uit Albanen, nog een rabbit hazen. Honentel, Makolila. 
یعنی مو هپی تو خاطر برونی اپاتی شوخ جورا در زیرو بخت گور استور تت خاطر بوتت ما صندوق انا نواجب ما مافن ای لتی شو یوم را بنگورن یال سا تیز دیت گور so that didn't work. <laughs> That's just kind of like just like kind of like you know Syrian type dialect uh, from a long time ago. Of course, you're hearing there. But I'll show you the part two later. They have two, you know, that kind of like humorous thing there. But um, so yeah, that's that's the Assyrians, like their their background, uh, you know, as an empire. And um, yeah, also you know, they have their you know famous you know capital. I think I've got pictures showing like their capital uh, that they have of Nineveh. Here's kind of an image of Nineveh, which um, I think there's. A, I thought I had a picture showing like there's the library. Of course, it's very famous. I'll get to later uh, that supposedly was built there. But there's the capital of Nineveh uh, right there, with, which now of course is in ruins today. Uh, of course, not much left of it now. It was later destroyed. Uh, and um, Anyway, um, they had different rulers that were, of course, well known. I did want to mention about, of course, about about the Assyrians as a culture. Here's kind of a map, another map showing you uh, the Assyrians. But they had one ruler named Sargon the Second. He's probably considered one of their best rulers, after Tiglath Pelazar the Third, who they think kind of maybe starts the whole Assyrian Empire, the, the Neo Neo Assyrian Empire that we're kind of talking about uh, here. Sargon uh, is really famous. He was one of the sons. Of uh, Tiglath Pelzar III, uh, and um, he's considered really one of the most famous uh, Assyrian rulers of the Neo Assyrian state because he had a dynasty of, of kings that kind of came afterwards that were named after him called the Saganid dynasty, uh, which includes about, I believe it has about um, something like five or six, five or six kings in it uh, total. Uh, actually, seven, seven kings are in it, actually. And um, it's got three main successors and then, of course, a few others that are in there. But you can see the ones that were famous were Sir Sargon. You had uh, Sennacherib, Esarhaddon, and also Ashurbanabal was another famous ruler uh, that was well known. His father, his father, who reigned previously in the 8th century, Tiglath Pelzar III, they consider him to be the one that they think creates the actual reforms that makes the whole Neo-Assyrian state or empire that's really uh, they're known for later. They think he's also the one that kind of develops a lot of their professionalized armies uh, that they use to expand their state uh, more in the Near East. And um, I think under him, you can see his map of the size of the empire was about in those areas that's in um, kind of like that peach color looking area. Those are the peak areas uh, they think under Sargon the second. So you can see they controlled part of most of Iraq down to Babylon at one point. Uh, part of um, part of you can see southern Turkey, uh, Iran, Syria, and then part of northern Israel was also taken over by them as well. Uh, you can see all the deportations too. That's kind of a map showing you all the peoples that were deported, of course, too back to Assyria. So yeah, you had Sargon II. Uh, the other king I'll mention too that was very famous that a lot of historians always talk about, which is Ashurbanabal. Uh, he's a very famous king, of course. It was really the 7th century king, but he's really one of the most famous ones. I think I want to say the fourth king, I think, of that dynasty. And um, it's under him that the empire peaks in the Iron Age of the Assyrian state. Uh, under him, Nineveh became a very powerful capital. Uh, of, like I said, northern Iraq, where it was. Uh, the actual size of Nineveh was close to 100, over 100,000 range. So at the time, it was considered one of the largest cities in the world. I think after that, it's like Babylon, I think is the next big city after that that you have uh, worldwide at the time. Well, you can see it, it had about a size of about 1,730 acres, four to five square miles was the area of where, of course, uh, Nineveh was uh, at one point. Uh, however, if you know about it, later it was destroyed. And now today it's mostly just, mostly ruins. It's actually located near the um, city of Mosul, uh, which is in northern Iraq. And 
a lot of the city was destroyed. You know, they, they rebuilt parts of like the gates into the city and things like that uh, that you're looking at. Uh, but primarily, it's not much there left from the original city uh, that was there. Yeah, his empire was pretty massive. Like Ashurbanipal, it was even a little bigger. Uh, he at one point, I think briefly, I think they controlled Egypt for a while, uh, but they later lost it as well. But those are kind of the areas that they controlled at one point uh, under the Neo-Assyrian um, Empire. Uh, the other thing that Ashurbanipal is famous for, which I kind of mentioned briefly about, he had this library uh, that he built uh, that was part of like a wing of his palace complex. And um, this became known as the so-called Royal Library of Ashurbanipal. Uh, and it was considered, by the way, one of the first organized libraries in the world, uh, which composed, by the way, uh, this Royal Library was uh, this in part of the Imperial Palace where it actually uh, compiled or contained about something they think about, I want to say more than 30,000 tablets of information you know, about the um, ancient world of the time of Mesopotamia. And uh, in the 1850s, it was discovered by this um, archaeologist named uh, Austin Henry Layard, uh, who found it. And, of course, as you know, uh, they later found a complete copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, at that site. I think it's the most famous thing they found. I know that's part of some of the tablets they found there uh, at the site. And apparently uh, Alexander the Great was influenced heavily by this particular library, if you know about this. And they think that the library itself influenced the Library of Alexandria to be built by him uh, in ancient Egypt at the time. Uh, this is, of course, back in the uh, fourth century B.C. Uh, and so that's why I guess that library is famous now. And uh, they I'll get to it later, but, you know, parts of it, uh, you know, or now, just like I said, just ruins. Uh, and I think recently, I want to say when ISIS controlled that northern part of Iraq, I know they tried to destroy some of the antiquities uh, that are actually there. Now, um, Assyria, Assyria did not last forever. You know, it, 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 was, it was the state, like I said, that was really powerful at one point, but over time it becomes kind of this weakened state uh, that, that basically had internal issues that were part of it. And what they think happened was that sometime in the late part of the 7th century BC, uh, the empire collapsed due to internal civil war because uh, they had held it together with their massive, you know, armies I told you about uh, that the Assyrians had. Uh, mostly it was the Chaldean people, so I'll get to in a second, that really were behind it. But apparently it was a multiple states that were kind of involved in attacking Assyria at the same time, which I think was like a combination of the Chaldeans, uh, which were a Semitic people uh, in southern Iraq, uh, the Scythians, and the, also the so-called Medes or Median peoples, the Medes, uh, which were in Media. Both the Scythians and the Medes were in um, northern Iran, like Iranian peoples. And they kind of combined as an allied coalition to eventually attack the Assyrian Empire and destroy it. And Nineveh was uh, destroyed in 612 BC, so-called Battle of Nineveh. Well, they sometimes nickname it. But combination of, like I said, those three groups, Gaudians, Medes, Scythians, you know, uh, they helped to basically cause the collapse of the Assyrian Empire. Over time, like over two, three years, eventually by 609, the remnants of it were gone of what was left of the Assyrian Empire. Now, what happened, though, was the empire, uh, well, I guess the remnants of it, uh, they have a new state uh, that eventually emerges to basically replace it, which is called the Neo-Assyrian uh, Empire that you have. It's kind of this short-lived empire that emerged in that area we're talking about. And it was it went around very long. It was only around for like I want to say seventy. Was, I think it was seventy four years. I think was how long it was around. It was it went around very long. It was like basically seventy eight years, uh, roughly. They call it the Chaldean Empire. That was the the name what they probably call it. Just Chaldea, I think is the common name they called it. But later on, they have a name for it that historians kind of start calling it, which is either Neo or New. Babylonian Empire. 
And it was an empire that was controlled by the Chaldean peoples who were these type of Semitic people uh, that lived kind of south of Babylon. They, they actually were more the southern part of Iraq and Kuwait, I think is about where they lived uh, as a people. And um, the empire itself, it was called, you know, Neo, Neo or Neo, but, yeah, Neo or Neo because of the fact that the state was centered around Babylonia and the capital of Babylon, which Babylon hadn't really been an important center of power uh, in hundreds of years. I think the Kassites had some power, but the Assyrians had had a lot of power, you know, more in the north, as you know, at Asher and, you know, at Nineveh. And so that's why they do that. But also the fact that they also call it that because they don't want people to confuse, you know, the old Babylonian empire of Hammurabi with this newer one uh, that emerges at Babylon. So that's hence the name, you know, being used of why they call it that. Uh, it actually, uh, and I'll get to it in a little bit. You probably heard of King Nebuchadnezzar II. He was one of their main rulers, but they actually had a founder of it. His name was actually King Nebuchadnezzar. He was a Chaldean uh, ruler of southern Iraq, like close to Babylonia. He founded the state, uh, they think, originally like sometime in the 620s. Uh, and then his son, which is Nebuchadnezzar II, is the one that really is more well-known, you know, the one that pretty much solidifies the state and is the longest reigning ruler uh, overall. I think I've got like a slide on Nebuchadnezzar, uh, which is right here. But Nebuchadnezzar was very famous. Like if you think about him, uh, he's really considered to be one of the greatest rulers in the Bible. Well, he's mentioned in multiple books, uh, as you know. Uh, and uh, he reigned for a long time. Like over, you can see he reigned for over 40 years. So at one point, like looks like 43 or 42 years uh, he was in power. Uh, his name comes from a god, which is Nabu. Nabu was the um, originally like a kind of like a, I guess a Babylonian god of wisdom uh, and uh, was often associated with being the son of Maratuk or Marduk, uh, we talked about before. And so hence, that's that's where his name originates from uh, with that. Like I said, he's considered one of the greatest rulers uh, like in ancient times. And at one point, some people did call him, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar the Great. That yeah, some people often use. And I think there's even a deal where, I don't know if you know in modern times, but uh, they even have a deal where, uh, I don't know if you ever seen one of those large bottles of wine. I don't know if you've seen that before. They have different names, but I think there's one called a Nebuchadnezzar. If I've heard of that, which is like real huge. You know how big it is, how many liters it is, but um, it's usually named after him, of course. So if you ever drank a Nebuchadnezzar, you'd be pretty drunk, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Now, what was Nebuchadnezzar famous for? Well, he's famous for a lot of things. Uh, the big thing he did, as you know, was he rebuilt Babylon. Like he rebuilt pretty much most of the fortifications uh, that went around the city. He built a lot of the gates, which I'll get to later, the Ishtar Gate, of course, the one most famous gate that he constructed. A lot of the palace complexes uh, were built by him. Uh, they think he also built a couple of ziggurats, also in Babylon, which the one that was the most famous was supposedly in Temenanki, which I told you may have been one of the tallest uh, ziggurats ever built that may have been over 200 feet tall. Some people think it was a rebuilt version of the Tower of Babel, which they're not sure if that's true or not. Uh, the other thing he's known for, which I've shown you before, uh, is he, of course, is very famous for uh, building the um, so-called uh, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which I've, I've kind of shown pictures of before, uh, which they think was at one point, you know, one of the seven wonders of the world uh, that was constructed and I uh, suppose it was built on the east bank of the Euphrates River. Uh, and it was this basically this ziggurat that was built to look like a mountain, which a lot of ziggurats look like mountains. They would put trees and greenery on it. It also had mechanical waterfalls that supposedly fell from the top of it uh, and all that. And uh, it was constructed for his wife, who was a princess who originally came from uh, the kingdom of the Medes, like Media. In Iran, her name was Queen Amitus, 
Uh, but at one point, you know, the, the Greeks thought it was, you know, one of the seven wonders of the world a long time ago. Uh, later, they think it collapsed, though. If you know about it, you can see it behind me, too. I guess it's supposed to be the actual uh, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, uh, which is right there. But they think it later collapsed around the time of um, Alexander the Great, who supposedly tried to rebuild it or something like that uh, when he took over Iraq uh, back in the fourth century. But, but anyway, it's something he's kind of known for. Um, and then, um, of course, the other thing that they always talk about, uh, which is famous about... Um, is the Ishtar Gate. That's one thing supposedly he built that's real, real famous, you know, was this main entrance uh, that went into uh, the actual main city. Uh, and uh, I think it's one of, they'd say, eight gates that may have been part of the city at one point. It actually honored two gods. Ishtar, obviously, because the name of Ishtar, you know, the famous fertility goddess. And then also Martuk, of course, also they think it also honored as well uh, they think that's maybe what it looked like, kind of a bluish color. It had dragons and bulls on it. Uh, they were drawn on it. And um, apparently what happened was in the 1930s, German archaeologists excavating Babylon, and they decided to dismantle it, the actual gate. They brought it back to Berlin. They put it back together. They put it in this museum in Berlin that's called the Pergamon Museum, which you may have heard of. I think I've got an image of the actual, that's a replica of it you're looking at right there, but the real gate is actually located uh, in actually Germany. So it's kind of a controversial thing, you know. They took the gate and brought it to Germany because uh, a lot of the European powers did take a lot of antiquities from, you know, Egypt and Iraq and a bunch of these other countries and still still have them today. Um, and so it's kind of a big controversy uh, with that. Uh, Babylon, by the way, uh, was a huge, it was a huge city. Uh, they think at one point it was, you know, multiple, multiple square miles. Here's kind of an image of maybe what uh, Babylon looked, maybe looked like a long time ago. You can see with the Ishtar Gate. And you can see in Temanaki in the background, uh, right there, kind of going straight up 200 some feet or whatever how big and tall it was. Uh, and uh, they do think it may have had a population that was exceeding maybe close to 200,000, uh, which may have been the largest in the world at that time. And the square mileage of the city may have been close to four miles in size and in comparison. Uh, the actual ruins of Babylon are located about 50 miles uh, south of Baghdad. Uh, and if you know about it, uh, Saddam Hussein, who I've talked about before, you know, who was the president of Iraq has tried to re he tried to rebuild it. You know about like the some of the ancient sites, you know, of, of, of Babylon, uh, which see right, we see right here. And I think I told you he spent something like um close to half a billion dollars trying to reconstruct a lot of these sites uh, that are there. So a lot of this was done around the 1980s well, in in um modern Iraq uh, today. Uh, and um, I think I've got some images that added kind of shows the, the site right here showing like part of the actual palace complex of what is supposed to be like Nebuchadnezzar, like where he may have ruled from uh, at one point. And so he spent a lot of money trying to do that. I think I, think I told you he tried to rebuild like Ur and the Ziggurat of Ur and House of Abraham and all these things. And I know Saddam is like this tyrant that they always talk about, dictator that controlled Iraq and caused all those wars. Uh, but, yeah, he was kind of big in trying to, you know, restore a lot of ancient Mesopotamia's antiquities from like a long time ago. Now, what happened to, you know, the the actual state of Nebuchadnezzar? Now, there were some things that he did that were kind of, you know, infamous, infamous that you may have heard about uh, with, you know, um, Nebuchadnezzar. I, I, I didn't quite mention about this, but was one thing he was very famous for, of course, which I didn't mention about, and that's the fact that he also conquered the kingdom of Judah, uh, which is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Judah was this um, small, you know, leftover Israelite state that was in the southern part of Israel, where the West Bank is to, and where Jerusalem is. It had survived, by the way, the Assyrian period. Uh, it was kind of like this vassal state. Uh, that was known for uh, its economy, I think, of mostly olive oil. 
Uh, and so, but apparently uh, it got on the bad side of, of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians because of the fact that the kingdom of Judah became allied with the Egyptians. Uh, and so uh, what eventually happened was 580s BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar invaded. I think it took him two or three years, but he eventually laid, laid waste to it, sacked the city, destroyed the Temple of Solomon, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned in several books of the Bible. The book of Daniel, of course, being the most famous, uh, book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, book of Kings. Uh, and he's kind of seen as this villain, I guess, to uh, the Israelites later uh, in the Bible, the Jews. Under, under him, you know, the Jews were forced into captivity for something like several decades. Uh, and they think it kind of influenced their religion later. Uh, so... That could be why you get all these stories in the Bible, the Tower of Babel and all these other things because of because of the influence of sin and Temanaki and all these things that the Babylonians were, of course, were, were known for. Uh, what happened to the Babylonian state? Well, there, there were other rulers that reigned later, like sons and grandsons, I guess, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, but uh, they later folded uh, to uh, what is the Persian Empire, which was based in Iran to the east. They were just a more powerful state, and they got absorbed uh, into uh, the Persian Empire, which will take over the Near East from, like, Iran, you know, Turkey, all the way to Egypt at one point. Because, you know, the Persian Empire becomes one of the largest Near Eastern empires uh, that you have. And so the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Chaldean Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, that he, that he helped kind of help establish – was really your last major Semitic empire that you have or state that actually rules uh, in ancient times or even medieval times. Because uh, I think most states that come later uh, that control Mesopotamia, you know, later Iraq, are mostly controlled by peoples that are not Semitic, uh, you know, that are there. Uh, I think you have other states later that come in, you know, up to like, you got the Greeks and the Romans and that come in after the Persians. And then you got even the Ottoman Empire, uh, which were, were not Semitic either. Uh, they control that vast amount of territory. So kind of a history, you know, of, of ancient Mesopotamia uh, that you have here. And um, later in the week, you know, I'm going to move on. I'm going to, of course, be talking next about we're going to get into ancient Egypt. That's my next topic I'll talk about, which will be like in a three part lecture. Uh, series I'll have, which will be week two and part of week three uh, they'll have. So uh, later in the week on, I think, Wednesday, I'll kind of go into and talk about the background of Egypt, uh, its history, how it gets unified. And I'll talk about other er culture of Egypt that's kind of well known uh, as well. So I don't think I've got any other questions as, as far as I can tell uh, right here or comments. But uh, if you do have any comments, questions about this lecture, you know, Please let me know on you know, my channel, uh, or uh, if you have any other, you know, comments, questions about the class, you know, please let me know via email. I think everybody's got my email, uh, pretty much. Uh, and uh, before I go, remind you, don't forget you have various assignments. You have a lot of assignments out. You know, contract policy page, like I said, still need that. If you haven't given that to me yet, either email it or upload it to the speed grader on Canvas. Prius requests. That's due later midweek, so try to get that done. Ancient Mesopotamia quiz, number two. I just posted that today, so that'll be due sometime next week to get that done. And don't forget, coming Monday next week, uh, your first vocabulary will also be due uh, as well. So that's it for today. Um, I'll probably send out some announcements later, you know, about the upcoming uh, Egypt lecture. But before I go, I did have part two. Uh, video I'll show you uh, on the Syrian on the Syrian dialect, the Neo Syrian or Syriac, uh, and that's it for today. Brony, oh Brony, kelo, Brony kelo. Hi, I'm Alaka. Hello, hello, Brony. Thank you. It's fine. Mori shmi lochi, Brony. Tcha toch gwiri gukan. Hey, shmi ana. Hey, hey, wo Brony tcha toch rab zgiri kiri ari da chamzluuti diya gavdo. Hola, makhwato. Hal de singa. Mashinam toch de Brony. Love you, Jeanette.
فيش جنه اي هر منشي بها سبروني لا نقشا ولا تشومدي وفي جنه هاني ترى في بودي كل ما زدت كوز خويره هاني باكا وريو ساوا بروني في بخشا لمسه طاينه من تيلي جوره <تصفيق> ايه وبلا عادي دخيك سودا جانو هارا دخل تيريك زبلا مارا تيريك فلا سير خريوه هار اوي تاباتي اكسباردي وتاريخ ديوخ كيريار زي اللابا طابي شني هاني ترافي بابروني هارا خطرت سنجل كل خيطة وتقذي لمقام كمبيوتر وقواذي من ديم صون 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 ديم صون